Okay, everybody, welcome back. Thank you very much for returning back to the second part of this video. If you haven't seen the first part, please click the link wherever it is here. Um, it should be on this page on the video in front of you. Click on that to watch the first part. Now, this is connected to, we're gonna follow up with what we are seeing in the global economy, the global commerce of the Atlantic world. Again, looking at the Triangle Trade, Middle Passage, and the Navigation Act, and at the center of that, the slave economy. And so we're looking at this map here, and you just did a brainstorm. Hopefully, if you haven't, please go back to do it. Look at the first video, and uh, and we're exploring this picture of what it means of this people, these people that were coming over, forced onto the slave ships, brought over from Africa into this new economy of slaves, the slave economy. Now, we looked at how half a million went to the British colonies in North America and how four to five million went to the Caribbean and another f maybe five, even more, went to South America. And the hints I gave you at the end of that video was think about what they're being used for in the labor force. So what did you come up with? What are some of the thoughts? Well, what I would hope that you have a think about and look at is in this North America, we have half a million coming over, which is a lot, but in the big system of 100, uh, of 10 to 30 million people, that's quite a smaller percentage compared to what's, and, and especially with the landmass of where they're coming to in the Caribbean and in South America being used mostly um, in plantations and uh, on the coastal areas as well into, uh, if you look at Brazil and into Mexico for mining. Now, if you look at this being used for mining, used for sugar, and these regions here, and, and the, the, the labor was so horrific, so intense, that a lot of people died. In fact, the majority of first generation coming to this region would have died in the horrific conditions of the labor that they had to do in the South American and Caribbean trade of, uh, of sugar plantations and mining and so forth. Whereas as bad as the conditions were, and we know, and we're going to look at it and in, in further throughout this course, the horrific conditions of slave conditions in North America and in the colonies and later in the United States, but it wasn't killing them off at the rate of the rest of the Americas. That's the big thing. We have a half a million slaves, Africans coming over, first generation slaves coming over, but they were able to, in large part, survive. It was cotton fields, it was tobacco fields, it was conditions that valued their life surviving to have children so they don't have to get new slaves coming in. You understand what I'm saying is that they're able to have a half a million slaves come in and or thereabouts but then survive and have next generations and become african americans in this way so an identity of africans coming over and rather than dying which was happening in the caribbean and south america where they had to bring people over the conditions were so bad that they were dying and they had to bring more in and more in and more in before it gets to four five 10 million, maybe even more, coming in as just first generations for the whole time of this Middle Passage occurrence and after that we know with the illegal slave trade that was even more horrific. So uh, if you think about this, this is big and this tells us a lot about identities. So if people are able to come over, settle, have families, create communities, create communities, slave communities, slave identities develop and merge with identities that are happening and forming in the regions around them, whether it's in the Caribbean, whether it's around Mexico, whether it's in the colonies of the, the British colonies and later American um, uh, areas, United States or South America, you get this syncretization mixture of cultures from Africa and wherever they are to create new lasting identities that we still see today. The foundation of that for North America and the story that we're looking at in this U.S. history class is the first generation compared to the rest of the Americas survived and were able to really settle and to create a strong 
perseverance, ideas of identity that is so strong in the, in the slave societies and grows into 21st century African-American societies that has its root in this story. So a lot of part of that, here's another map to kind of show what's happening here of where they're going. And it just tells of the broader story of how the slave trade was horrific, but also has a, a story of identity of a new direction um, that's in a very important part of the narrative. Now, the slavery, again, I mentioned in the West Indies was so horrific, um, uh, so brutal, that uh, a lot of them died the first generation. So, so that's the middle passage, and that's perhaps we could call that the bottom part of this triangle. So if we're looking at the triangle trade, which is here, the idea is that in the Americas, and if you think of the colonies we've explored so far, having a development of a, an economy, whether it's an agricultural economy, whether it's a whaling or, or rice in some places, also um, Mississippi, South Carolina, um, you start to get rice. There's silk plantations, indigo, tobacco. Um, more manufacturing goods as uh, industrialization starts to take root later on. And that all has to go to England. And then once it goes to England, once the manufactured goods here and goes down to Africa, trades, and you start to see this economy and then able to bring the slaves back over. And you have this circle or rather this triangle of commerce that develops. Now, why? The question I have for you is why then did the people in the Americas have to send it to Europe? Now think of you, if you owned a plantation and you had cotton and you knew that the cotton, a big part of that industry, a big part of who, who were buying that was in Africa because Africa was able to then trade it with the Islamic world to the east and trade the cotton that was being grown in the south of the colonies and eventually makes its way across other trade networks. So if you live there and you had a, a plantation, why would you want it to go Bristol or go to England for a lot less price than if you sold it directly to other places? Why not cut out the middleman? Well, that ties to the Navigation Act. And this is the important part of that Navigation Act is that Britain wanted a piece of it all, right? This is a British economy. So the colonists, were independent. They were a force, an economic force of the British Empire, as was other parts of whether it's French or other European colonies in the Americas. So if you had a colony, if you had a plantation of cotton, you had to, by law, under the Navigation Acts, navigate those ships to England, even if it was just to go to the harbor and be unloaded, stamped, with a certain seal of approval and tax you had to pay, most importantly, then put back on the ship, that was enough to allow it to happen and then go on its merry way to wherever it needed to go. But the main idea of this Navigation Act was to get the goods, make sure they come to England to get the tax before it went anywhere else. So that kept that triangle in its shape. If this wasn't in place, the Navigation Act, then it would just go willy-nilly all over the place. People would definitely, if you had a business, you want to get the best price for it, and that would definitely not be going back to England. It would definitely not going back to uh, where they're going to have the lowest price possible, but if it was enforced by law, you had no choice unless you did it by smuggling. And so there's a huge smuggling culture that develops. And we talk, and piracy, this is where you get a lot of the piracy coming into play. In the Caribbean, you have people who flee and create their own economy and do something where the wild pigs who are roaming there and they make bacon and they, they get known as the bacon, bacon ears or as we know it, the buccaneers. That's where the word buccaneers comes from. But people are trying to create their own economies, their own lifestyle by navigating away from acts like this and creating smuggling cultures and, and other ways of making money that didn't have to go to England or other European powers. However, overall, this was the most powerful force in the Americas. This was the most powerful force that, in, that kept the economy together, where you had trade from the Americas going to England, and England was making sure that they were trading with the rest of Europe, with Africa, and in Africa, those slaves coming across. 
So that's a big part of this story. Um, I hope that sort of clears up a little bit of some of the main ideas of this triangle trade and what's happening between both what we're looking at and the development of the colonies in North America, their interaction with Africa, and the horrific atrocities of the slave trade that goes across the Atlantic, how this brings a, not only a, a goods that are interacting, but of, I think of everything that's happening with the world system of exchange. And going back to the, quest, the question originally is, how is this triangle trade part of a world system of exchange? Well, it's very clear in this picture, the goods that are being exchanged, the people that are being exchanged. But what else? How does this show, or how can we see transference of ideas, identities, and that's what we're going to be looking at next week when we look at the Enlightenment and ideas that are developing in Europe. And they're developing in Europe, but interacting with the rest of the world as well. And that's an important thing to think about if you're taking a philosophy class or looking at other classes that talk about the concept of the Enlightenment. That was not a European vacuum either. But those are ideas coming from all over the world to influence and to create ide identity changes in Europe. But those changes of the Enlightenment start to make its way to the colonies as well. And those ideas are going to light a match of revolution. They're going to light a match of, of identities, formation of, of individualism, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which are words from John Locke. Also, we have parts of it from Rousseau and other European intellectual thinkers. Those thoughts are traveling back and forth as well as we talked about with the slave economy, that those thoughts are traveling and into the identities of slaves from Africa and across the Caribbean and how identities with ideas are in this triangle trade as well. So think about those things as you go through the reading, as you do the discussions this week and next week, as we look at both the slave trade and the words of Equiano, and we look at the identities through enlightenment changes as well. Awesome. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.